Greetings, everyone. Uh, we are here in London, and I couldn't be more excited because here to my right is Dr. Peter Mortimer. Uh, we are at St. George's Hospital, St. George's University. And we are being doing a, a live stream symposium. Uh, normally, I don't get in front of the camera to do these. Uh, I don't know how you do these so regularly. I don't <laughs> find it that terribly comfortable to be able to sit here and have to do it. But uh, in this case, I couldn't be more thrilled because Dr. Mortimer is not only a member of a LEARN's Scientific Medical Advisory Council, uh, but he also has become a, a great friend. Uh, by the way, for those that don't know me, uh, Bill Rapisi. I'm the uh, CEO of the Lymphatic Education and Research Network based uh, in New York, but uh, an international uh, organization focused on research, education, and advocacy. Uh, first, I would just like to do a little introduction of uh, uh, Dr. Mortimer. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the topic of today's symposium will be the genetic basis of primary lymphedema in humans, uh, the current state of the science. I think this will be of particular interest to, to so many in our audience who, who seek more information when it comes to uh, primary lymphedema. You couldn't get this information from a better source. Uh, Dr. Mortimer has been physician to the skin department at St. George's and consultant skin physician to the Royal Marsden Hospital since 1986. So I think we can say you have been there right from the very beginning when uh, lymphatics and lymphedema uh, begins to become interesting at all to the medical profession. His interest goes all the way back to when he was in Oxford, when his thesis actually uh, revolved around lymph flow. Dr. Mortimer is not only one of the most renowned uh, lymphedema and lymphatics physicians and researchers, uh, he is also one of the most beloved in the field, and that's not something I say uh, lightly. Uh, I say it because it is, uh, it, it is so true. As we start and I, the symposium, and as I turn things over to uh, Dr. Mortimer, uh, first I just wanted to talk a little bit about a new book that Dr. Mortimer has uh, authored. The book is called Let's Talk Lymphedema. And the book was inspired uh, to a great extent by an international photographer and author by the name of Gemma Levine. Now, some of you may not have heard that name before, especially those uh, in the United States. However, my guess is you very much are familiar uh, with her photography. She has done over 20 books, and her photographs include luminaries uh, such as Princess Diana, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Henry Moore, uh, Stephen Hawking, and on and on and on. Uh, so, she also did a book a few years ago regarding her cancer. Uh, Gemma now has lymphedema. And she came to Dr. Mortimer and had proposed the idea of them doing this book. Uh, I'd like to just ask Dr. Mortimer now a, a few questions uh, re regarding this. Uh, Dr. Mortimer, I, I know that uh, Gemma Levine came to you at first with interest in this book, but tell me, why is it you felt there was a need, and what did you hope this book might accomplish? Okay, well, first of all, Bill, very warm welcome to you, and thank you so much for coming to London. It's a real thrill to have you on this side of the pond, and uh, I hope we look after you very well. And uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to have you uh, part of this symposium. Uh, in answer to your question, uh, the... The reason I did the book was because Gen Gemma asked me, and anyone who knows Gemma, she's a remarkable and quite formidable woman um, who's, uh, she knows what's best, and she says this needs to be done. But the, the real answer is because lymphedema, as you well know, is such uh, a, a, a neglected uh, area in healthcare today uh, that it needs more attention. Now, LEARN uh, is doing a fantastic job in that regard, but I felt there was still a need for a book that explained in lay terms what lymphedema was, a little bit about the lymph system, but to try and do it in a way that hopefully was a, uh, an interesting read, uh, hopefully imparts uh, an amusing read, and yet informative. So that's why we did the book. 
In, in that regard, who did you see as the audience for this book? Well, I wrote the book with the public in mind uh, and thinking, well, would this be available? Could they get this through Amazon? And that's, that was in the fourth, uh, f forefront of my mind when I was writing it. Uh, in truth, I suppose it is intended really for lymphedema sufferers, families of lymphedema sufferers, people who want to know about lymphedema having heard about it. And uh, as you and I know, that's quite a lot of people because some years ago I wrote a very small little book uh, called Lymphedema Advice for Patients and the lifetime sales of that book has been 55,000. So it's there are plenty of people out there who want to know about lymphedema and hopefully this book's going to be another source of information for them. I mean certainly one thing that you did with this book, it's, it's so expansive in that regard, uh, you did ask Kathy Bates, contributed a chapter. And uh, I asked you, Bill, and you very, very kindly. I was uh, very honored uh, to be able to contribute uh, a chapter from my perspective of what the issues are that I have seen regarding this field of lymphedema and why it has lagged behind uh, other diseases, both in, in knowledge, but also in creating the kind of movement that we need to drive the level of research. But one of the things that I appreciate so much about the approach of your book is the way that you have completely humanized lymphedema in that regard. Uh, people will get all the technical information they would want to know about lymphedema. Um, however, at the same time, there are also stories of mm. people who have lymphedema. There are also photographs of people that Gemma took of people with lymphedema. And what I find as a layperson so phenomenal about that is generally when we see lymphedema, we see it dehumanized. We see an arm, a leg, a limb detached from a body where the focus is just on the disease. Or we see a figure with tape across the eyes, which is meant to protect the identity, but at the same time, if you can't look into the soul, if you can't look into the eyes, you don't know what lymphedema really means. You need to see the pain and the fear in people's eyes and having to deal with this disease. And the beautiful photographs combined with the way you approach this book just make it a phenomenal piece for the community at large and everyone who is touched by this disease. So I, I just want to very much thank you uh, for allowing our participation, but also for doing this, this extraordinary book. Well, thank you. And I, I mean, I think uh, you and Kathy Bates in particular have led the way in terms of trying to project stories. So the, the basis of the book is, is largely patient stories. They're true stories. Patients have given um, the information to me. They know they're appearing in the book, albeit anonymously, but they know that their stories are there and that they're represented. I th I'm particularly pleased with the children's chapter because the children there, all three of them, were happy to be identified. And there are pictures of them in the book. And I think that uh, that's a very Im moving and powerful message when uh, you get children with lymphedema uh, standing up saying, we need better, we want better. And of course, we were also very fortunate, and this was Gemma's idea, to get uh, quotes and endorsements from famous people, uh, from celebrities, uh, including uh, people like Dame Judi Dench, a famous actress like Kathy, uh, from Sir John Major, past Prime Minister, and other uh, dignitaries who may not have known about lymphedema, but were prepared to say, wow, yes, you've explained this to me. I had no idea, and I'm very happy to provide a quote for the book. So that creates more interest so that people, I think, when they pick up the book, might sit up and take notice. Very much. I had uh, uh, dinner with Gemma last night, and so Judy Dench's name came up. And she said that uh, Dame Judy Dench was actually going to India to uh, do a film and did ask, given the incidence of lymphedema there, uh, is there anything that she could do while she is there to support this cause? So by bringing celebrities in, the kind of notoriety they bring once you get their attention,
I think what you've done is, is really phenomenal in that regard. Well, thank you. But I think Learn and you in particular, Bill and Kathy, have led the way on that. So I think you can take some credit for the book because uh, it, it's guided that approach. I think maybe what you're mentioning is we, we really are creating more of an international movement at this point that we are all linked into that is going to drive this to its next phase of being a world priority. Absolutely. It is a global disease. Uh, with that, uh, we'll get back to the uh, topic at hand. Once again, the genetic basis of primary lymphedema in humans, current state of the science, uh, Dr. Peter Mortimer. Thank you very much. And good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you. I'm going to uh, tell you uh, about the work that I'm uh, doing on uh, the genetic basis of primary lymphedema. This is uh, our program of research uh, very much here at St. George's in London. And uh, I hope that to explain to you what we're doing and uh, how we're uh, adopting a different approach to uh, the diagnosis in particular of lymphedema and hopefully in the future how it might guide uh, treatment. I better just leave this slide up for a few seconds for you to uh, uh, just read the uh, important disclaimer uh, and then uh, we can uh, move on. So I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to go back to basis, basics and talk about lymphedema to start with and then I'll go into the more admittedly technical areas of the, um, of the primary lymphedema and the genetic aspects of lymphedema. So let's just start by uh, talking a little bit about lymphedema. Now, if you mention, and this, the book has taught me this, that if you mention lymphedema to anyone, certainly in the UK, they'll say, uh, isn't that what you get uh, after cancer? And uh, the answer it is. But what many people do not realize is that breast cancer related lymphedema, which hopefully you can see on the screen, uh, is actually only one eighth of all forms of lymphedema. So cancer related lymphedema probably makes up about a quarter and breast cancer related lymphedema makes up about uh, half of that. So there are a lot of other causes of lymphedema. Mention the word elephantiasis, which is also known uh, around the world. And when I've asked about elephantiasis, I've usually got the answer, uh, isn't that what the elephant man had? Well, the answer is uh, strictly no. Uh, although, just to qualify that, Proteus syndrome, which the elephant man did have, also has a lymphatic element to it. But that apart, elephantiasis is actually the grotesque swollen leg that you might see in tropical countries, particularly India. And again, this is what's shown on the screen here. You see a, a man who uh, Gemma phoned, uh, phoned, <laughs> filmed and took photographs of uh, using Apple technology and uh, remote uh, uh, Apple uh, photography uh, to show a man with a, a leg that looks like an elephant's leg. And that's where the word elephantiasis comes from. But remember, Elephantiasis is simply lymphedema and it happens to be a name used uh, in tropical areas where the cause is usually filariasis and that means uh, an infection born from a mosquito bite uh, which creates larvae growing in the lymph system and the worms that then develop block the lymph system to give you filarial lymphedema otherwise known as filarial elephantiasis. So that is what lymphedema can look like. And what is lymphedema? Well, lymphedema is effectively uh, a failure of the lymphatic system. So briefly, uh, what is the lymphatic system? Well, it's a network of drainage tubes connected to lymph glands that essentially cleanse the uh, body of waste uh, 
surplus fluid. So it has a role to cleanse the body's tissues. It has a role to recycle surplus fluid uh, and cells. And it has a particular role uh, to make sure that it guards against infection. Uh, because as you and I well know, if you get a sore throat, the lymph glands can come up uh, uh, fighting against infection. So it has a very important role in defense of body's tissues. Now, what's not even taught properly in medical school <laughs> is the fact that the blood uh, circulation supplies the body's tissues with what they need in terms of fluid, nutrients, uh, and oxygen, but actually then the tissues, uh, when they finish doing what they want to do, the cells will throw out waste and we need to recycle everything so that the lymph system is the cleansing system of the body. Uh, when it goes wrong, what happens? Well, it means that waste materials, cells, fluid, all build up in the tissue to give visible swelling it also means there's a problem locally with infection uh, and the combination of swelling and uh, horrendous infections at times is what lymphedema is all about. Now, I'm sorry if this slide on the left offends you. I just uh, want to make the point that uh, there are many different forms of lymphedema. It can affect a leg, a face, a breast, an arm, the genitalia, the body, anywhere. And there are many different causes. I've mentioned breast cancer-related lymphedema, and I've mentioned filariasis. But actually, in Western society these days, the epidemic is as much to do with immobility, because moving is an important way of getting the lymph system to work, and obesity. And obesity not only impairs lymph drainage, but lymph drainage can then also lead to increased deposition of body fat. So uh, in this slide, and if I can find the cursor, I don't know whether you can see it, but there's lymphedema in both legs, but there is also considerable lymphedema in this abdomen. So much of this swelling is lymphedema making the person look even fatter than they actually are. If we turn to the picture on the right-hand side, we see a different form of lymphedema. And this is another tropical form of lymphedema called podoconiosis. Um, this, is, uh, this arises where people, particularly in Ethiopia, uh, walk barefoot and particular silicate particles from the earth uh, get in through the skin and damage the limb system. And this picture on the right is courtesy of uh, Paul Matz and Claire Fuller, uh, two who are working tirelessly in Ethiopia to try and improve the lot of these sufferers of potoconiosis. So uh, why then do not all fat people get lymphedema? Why do uh, all cancer patients not get lymphedema? And why do not all patients who walk barefoot get lymphedema? Well, the answer is probably in the genes and a genetic predisposition or genetic susceptibility could well be the explanation for why some people get secondary lymphedema uh, and others don't. So I've used the word secondary lymphedema there. So what is secondary lymphedema? Well, it simply means that it's a lymphedema where there is a recognizable cause. So, such as cancer treatment, filariasis, podoconiosis. Um, but there is also primary lymphedema, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. And primary lymphedema is where there is an inherent or innate or genetic problem with the lymph system, so it doesn't work properly. Either there's a fault in the way that the lymph vessels have formed, so their structure is abnormal, uh, or there's a problem with the way the lymph vessels don't work, so there'll be a functional problem. Here you see on the slide before you uh, a young girl with primary lymphedema uh, 
uh, due to a genetic fault and that gene has now been recognized. That gene is important for the development of the lymphatic system and because it is not working very well in this young girl, it's giving rise to lymphedema everywhere. Her eyes are affected with lymphedema, her face is affected by lymphedema, her arms, her legs, her feet, and also the internal organs. So she uh, has a problem with her gut and absorbing food properly because the lymph vessels of her gut do not work properly. So the studying the genes uh, in these forms of primary lymphedema, uh, they're going to be very important to help us understand uh, what makes the lymph system work and when it goes wrong, what can we do to put it right? So as I've said, primary lymphedema is an intrinsic fault uh, in terms of the a failure of the lymph system to work properly. And it gives rise to uh, chronic edema, lymphedema, uh, due to that developmental abnormality. Now, uh, how that manifests will often de depend on the gene involved. So the phenotype, which is the physical characteristics of that person who has the gene fault, will vary according to the tissues affected, the time of onset, how it's inherited or not, if there are any other associated features, and so on. Now, primary lymphedema, if you go and see a, a doctor and they say you've got primary lymphedema, at best, all they will have done is to say, well, it came on at birth, you've got congenital lymphedema, end of story. Or many types of primary lymphedema will come on at puberty or sometimes soon after puberty, and that's been called lymphedema precox. And then other cases that may come on later in life have been called lymphedema tarda. But that doesn't help us understand the differences between the different forms of lymphedema in terms of the mechanism or the gene fault. So we've tried to look into this in more detail. And so we've introduced phenotyping, which means looking very carefully at all the associated features with the lymphedema to try and be more specific with that diagnosis. And that actually has enabled us and others to find certain genes that are then at fault and r responsible for producing that form of primary lymphedema. And that's called a genotype. So when we just categorize the patients according to phenotype, it's according to how they look and the investigations. If though we found the gene fault, we can actually look and detect that gene fault and that will give us a specific diagnosis and that's what's called the genotype. Here are some examples. Now, if we go to the picture of the slide, uh, you'll see that there are four pictures of primary lymphedema. And in not so very long ago, they would have just been diagnosed as congenital primary lymphedema. But in fact, we now know that there are four different genes causing these forms of primary lymphedema. And without wishing to get too complicated, the one in the top left-hand corner uh, is true Milroy's disease that you may have heard of uh, due to this mutation in, in a particular gene called VEGFR3. If we go down to the, uh, I'm trying to use the cursor but can't quite find it. If we go down to the bottom right-hand corner, then actually a, f a growth factor that stimulates that receptor, that's where the mutation is. And so they produce a very similar form of uh, uh, Milroy type lymphedema, but the gene is actually different. If we go to the top right hand corner, uh, this is a different gene altogether, but we now know that that gene is also responsible uh, uh, for affecting brain size, and also for affecting eyesight. So identifying a gene also tells you a lot about other possible abnormalities that can occur with the lymphedema. Uh, 
uh, and also a bit about the natural history and the prognosis of their condition. And in the bottom left hand corner, we have Turner syndrome. Now, to be fair, we don't know the mutation yet, but we know it is on a chromosome, uh, one of the female chromosomes, and uh, the, uh, or rather on the, one of the female chromosomes, so it's only females can get that uh, form of lymphedema. But here's an example where not so long ago, this would have just been called congenital lymphedema, and now we have genes identified that can enable us to make a specific diagnosis. Now, uh, if we go to the full screen and the slide here, this will make you panic, uh, but it's not meant to because this is how we approach our patients when they walk into the clinic. And I'm going to use the rest of the time uh, for the symposium of walking you through this chart, this algorithm that we use to try and understand what form of primary lymphedema our patient has. So we start at the top with what we call syndromic. Uh, we then move one down to what's called uh, systemic or visceral, which means is there any internal uh, body involvement with the lymphedema? And then we'll go on to issues of disturbed growth. And then we might end up with congenital or late onset. So let's look at the uh, syndromics. And what by syndrome we mean, has this patient before us got a recognized syndrome, like Down syndrome, or like Turner syndrome, or like Noonan syndrome? And that means that the lymphedema is not the dominant element uh, in the diagnosis, but it's nevertheless an important aspect of it. So if we look at Turner, first of all, Turner syndrome, as I said, is a fault on one of the female uh, chromosomes, and it uh, results in a very high level of uh, miscarriage from, uh, during pregnancy. Furthermore, many of the babies that are born are very swollen with fluid, and of course, it's not no surprise that much of that fluid is because lymphatic development is faulty and they therefore cannot manage to drain fluid or process it properly. Uh, Turner syndrome patients are female and they can have hand swelling, foot swelling, and they also struggle with infections. And in the picture here, the particular infection is wart virus infection but they can also get bacterial infections and fungal infections like any lymphedema patient. So diagnosis relies on looking at the chromosomes. It's not particularly an inherited disorder, but may occur rarely more than once in a family. And the mechanism appears to be a failure of the smallest lymph vessels to work properly. So, We've moved from the blue syndromic uh, box. We've now said, OK, that there is no recognizable syndrome. What do we do? Well, we then move to the next box, which asks the question, is there any internal vol involvement with lymphedema? In other words, a fault of drainage of fluid from the lungs, from the gut, from the heart, wherever it happens to be. And this has been a source of great interest recently because a number of new genes have been found to cause what we call a generalized lymphatic dysplasia. So the lymph fault is widespread throughout the body. And I'm going to just use one example here of a mutation called PISO1 that causes widespread fault, uh, widespread fault in lymphatic development. Um, it uh, also produces this hydrops, which is uh, widespread fluid of the fetus of the newborn, and it causes particular problems uh, such as facial swelling and facial infection, what we call cellulitis. And that, if we see that in a child, we think of this mutation. And hydrops is quite a common problem 
and we're beginning to realize that non-immune high drop, so it's not to do with any blood incompatibility, for example, the non-immune high drops, many of these patients will actually have a fault in their lymphatic development. And therefore, it's probably that failure in lymphatic development that's giving rise to so much fluid. And as it says on the slide, it can be frequently associated with a number of conditions. Noonan syndrome, Turner syndrome, Henicam, which was actually what the uh, child in the black and white uh, photographs had, and of course, PISO-1. So hydrops is a very, begin to realize that an indicator there might be a more widespread problem. So we've done the syndromic blue box. We've now said no to that. We have now uh, asked the question, is there any internal vol involvement as far as uh, lymphatic problems are concerned? And we've said no. So we then ask the next question, uh, is there any uh, disturbed growth or birthmarks uh, associated with this lymphedema. Now this box is slightly different from all the other boxes in that the uh, genetic fault is usually confined to the tissue affected rather than being in the blood uh, and therefore possibly inherited. So this problem uh, usually arises after birth where one cell that one cell type in a tissue uh, starts to mutate and therefore the mutation can affect different uh, tissues like fat, skin, muscle and, and cause overgrowth. And this has been a source of great interest, uh, this uh, area of overgrowth and I'll show you in the next slide why. This, this is a pathway uh, a cell signaling pathway called the mTOR pathway that has been very, very interesting for cancer biologists because this pathway makes cells turn over very quickly. They reproduce very, very quickly. And if that happens very, very quickly, then it can be involved with cancer development. But it can also, if it doesn't cause cancer, can also cause cells purely just to grow more than they should do, not in a malignant way, purely to get overgrowth. And there are a number of conditions, many of which associ are associated with lymphedema that can do this. And the important thing about this pathway and finding a gene fault associated with lymphedema in this pathway is we have drugs that can actually uh, normalize the, the signaling in this pathway and therefore treat elements uh, that have gone wrong like overgrowth and like lymphedema. So this rather a uh, bit of a mouthful of PIK3CA is right at the head of that pathway is the gene involved and it causes very characteristic overgrowth often associated with lymphedema and if I can just use one, um, if I've got now, there we are, there's the pointer. This KTS is known as Klippeltrenorni syndrome. And uh, it leads to uh, lymphedema, varicose veins, vascular birthmarks, uh, and overgrowth. So this young girl has been diagnosed with Klippeltrenorni syndrome. And she, as you can see here, has actually birthmarks in the skin. And there is quite obvious uh, lymphedema, particularly in the lower leg, feet and ankles. But on the back of her leg, uh, a lot of those birthmarks are actually uh, malformations of lymph vessels, not uh, uh, blood vessels, but lymph vessels. And l it is lymph that tends to leak out of those abnormal vessels. But she's also got lymphedema because the malformation, the malformed lymph vessels connect with the main lymph drainage routes to give rise to the lymphedema. So that's a lymphatic malformation. Here we have another lymphatic malformation. In other words, a gene fault, which we don't know, 
confined to the tissue has caused uh, malformation of lymph vessels, but they are not connected with the main lymph drainage pathway. So there's no lymphedema. The swelling is due to lymph fluid being trapped in the little lymph vessels and bigger lymph vessels of the thigh to cause swelling, but it's fluid, it's lymph fluid that's actually trapped within these malformed uh, lymph vessels, uh, whereas the normal lymph drainage pathways means that the lower leg is fine. And because the lymph doesn't know where to go, it will often bulge on the skin surface as little lymph blisters. So these forms of lymphatic malformation are referred to as mosaic disorders, which means the mutation is confined to the tissue. It's not inherited, it's not in the blood, but if we take a tissue sample from this site, we hopefully in due course will learn more about the mutations causing this, these sorts of lymphatic malformations. So we've now decided there's no syndrome with, uh, involved with lymphedema. There's no internal involvement of abnormal lymph vessels. And there is no overgrowth. So when we've done that, we've just got plain, simple lymphedema. We might then uh, say, well, has it come on at birth? or has it come on sometime later in life? And so I'm now going to look at one form of congenital lymphedema that many of you may have heard of called Milroy disease. Uh, this was the first primary lymphedema for which the gene was identified, the VEGFR3 gene. Um, and it's not that common and in fact, many patients with congenital lymphedema are often told they have Milroy disease, but unless the gene, the genotype, in other words, the gene mutation is identified, that person strictly hasn't got Milroy disease. So what is Milroy disease or Milroy uh, lymphedema? Well, as I say, it's a, due to a mutation in this vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 3. Sorry, bit of a mouthful that. Um, but what it's taught us, we've started to learn what other factors can be produced by these d uh, gene faults, what other uh, conditions. So uh, in these patients, not only do they have lymphedema of their toes, their feet, their ankles, and their legs up to their knees, but they also have abnormal veins, and they also can have lymph fluid around the testicle in the male. About a third of male infants born with this will have hydrocele. So that's effectively lymphedema of the testicle. And when we study these patients who uh, have a known gene fault, we start to understand more about how that gene fault uh, affects the lymph system. What goes wrong? Uh, where the fault is. And in Milroy disease, it's due to the fact, like in Turner, the small lymph vessels don't work properly. So if we look here, on the left is a normal lymph scan where we have injection of dye into each foot. So the right foot is there and the dye travels up the leg to the knee area and then onto the groin where the lymph glands sit. And we can see pretty well there are good lymph vessels working normally and there's good uptake of dye uh, as a surrogate for lymph in the lymph glands. In the Milroy patient with the gene fault, we don't see anything. That's not because the lymph system isn't there. It is there. We've shown that. But the problem is that the small lymph vessels, the little small lymph vessels, are just ab not absorbing material and fluid from the tissue. So nothing gets into the lymph system. And I believe that and in the bottom right hand corner you can see uh, little lymph vessels in the skin which are there in Milroy disease, they just don't work. And if through more research we can unlock the key that's failing to get these little lymph vessels to work, we can cure this condition. And I feel confident that can be achieved. So Milroy disease is inherited. It's not mosaic like the malformations and the overgrowth. 
it is inherited. Uh, you can inherit a mutation, but not necessarily g develop the disease. So the, 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 the mutation may not express itself in lymphedema if one's lucky. Uh, furthermore, a parent may be so mildly affected that they don't even know they've got the disease. And you don't have to inherit it. As an individual, one can develop this for the first time. And as I've said, the mechanism appears to be the little lymph vessels, they're there, but they just don't work. So we are now move from the congenital to the last uh, uh, box, which is called late onset. We don't distinguish anymore between puberty onset and tarda, later onset in life. And the reason for this is this condition, lymphedema distichiasis, due to a mutation in the gene called FOXY2. I won't elaborate on that. When I lectured once and said this was Foxy 2, uh, the audience misunderstood me because they thought I was being Foxy. But no, the, the gene is actually called Foxy 2. One of the problems with these symposia is you don't get the laugh back from the audience. So you can't quite appreciate whether anyone's uh, got the joke or not. So lymphedema distichiasis is due to uh, this mutation in Foxy 2. Dystochiasis means a double row of eyelashes. You might say, well, what's that got to do with lymphedema? Well, nothing directly. It's just that this gene makes the, this uh, eyelash phenomenon, uh, which should result in a follicle, an eyelash follicle, changing into a grease gland. That doesn't happen. And the lymph vessels don't develop at the very specific time that the embryo is growing. So what happens? This is a syndrome, but the lymphedema is the dominant feature. And unlike uh, Turner's syndrome, for example. So we get lymphedema onset at puberty usually, but we know that the lymphedema can come on many years after that. So this proves to us that although we've got one gene fault in one person, the lymphedema may come on at puberty, but in the next person in that family, it may not develop until that person's 40 or 50 years old. Again, we have a strong link with varicose veins and other abnormalities such as cleft palate. So this is a syndrome, a constellation of associated features caused by this one gene. And again, the lymphocentigraphy, you've got the picture on the left, which is the normal that I showed you before. And on the right, we have yet another abnormal appearance. And this is because the um, dye is being taken up by the lymph system. So those n little lymph vessels that weren't working in Milroy are working very well here. But what happens is that the lymph or the dye gets so far up the legs and then gravity makes it fall back down again. Why is that? Because the main fault here is the lymphatic valve. The lymphatic valve is very important for ensuring that lymph flows in one direction and can actually flow up against gravity. And that fails in this condition. So all the lymph just falls back down again. So here, the research work needs to concentrate on the lymphatic valve if we're going to find a cure here. So this condition is also inherited. Uh, interestingly, the double row of eyelashes occurs at birth, but the lymphedema doesn't appear until puberty. Interesting, we haven't explained that. Uh, and again, the mutation may be carried but not expressed, and the mechanism uh, is oh, because of a lymph valve failure giving rise to reflux of the lymph fluid. Now, one final gene fault. Again, we have it in this late onset primary lymphedema fault. And this gene is called GATA2. And why I'm mentioning this one is because this is a combination. This gene fault gives rise to uh, blood abnormalities uh, and to immunodeficiency.
that means this gene not only gives rise to lymphedema, but means that the bone marrow is affected, so the blood and particularly the cells responsible for fighting infection, uh, immune cells, are genetically faulty. And this gives rise, uh, in addition to the lymphedema, to life-threatening infections. And also, because of the blood abnormality, there is a risk of developing lymphedema, of uh, developing leukemia because of the blood abnormality. So it's important to recognize certain forms of lymphedema if they have uh, bone marrow abnormalities associated with them. And this means that lymphedema, which is often just dismissed as a non-fatal condition, is not non-fatal in certain genetic forms uh, where there are other abnormalities like faults with the immune system or with the blood. So the summary of my symposium, what the messages I want to get across to you are that if we identify the gene fault, the genotype, the mutation uh, for a particular type of primary lymphedema, it first of all permits an accurate diagnosis. There's no doubt then about what that person has. And once you know the gene fault and you know more about the gene, so you can then advise the patient in terms of uh, genetic counselling, likely inheritance and family planning. The other thing that uh, knowing the gene does is to tell you about the natural history. We can then know and watch patients as they, or children as they grow. We can understand the other abnormalities that may or may may not coexist and we know might what happen in the future like the leukemia and we can be alert to that uh, phenomenon. The other thing that knowing the gene fault does is it teaches us about the function of that gene. Biologists can then go off and look at cells, uh, look at animals and study the gene in more detail and try and understand what this gene does in normal physiology. And that's very important because then that might have a role in lots of other diseases where lymphatic malfunction, but not necessarily lymphedema, play a part. And finally, knowing the gene fault informs on the mechanism of the disease. Like in Muroy, the small little lymph vessels not absorbing fluid properly, or in lymphedema dystichiasis, where the valve is failing, and therefore that's where we need to target if we're going to provide a, right, a, a good treatment. I'd like to uh, really acknowledge the team that I work here at St George's, uh, particularly uh, in what we call the Lymphovascular Research Unit. I like that name because we all know about cardiovascular and the way that that affects the heart uh, and the blood circulation, but it doesn't really uh, generate the right interest in the lymphatic system. And lymphology is more the study of the lymph system. Here I think we have a clinical uh, name, lymphovascular medicine. And Professor Saha Mansour is the Professor of Clinical Genetics. Dr. Pierre Ostergaard uh, is in the laboratory and she's a reader in human genetics and she is the one that finds the genes. Professor Steve Jeffries, the retired uh, professor of uh, uh, genetics in the lab. Dr. Gordon's my uh, clinical uh, consultant colleague. Glenn Bryce did most of the phenotyping in the early days and is still an important uh, part of our research program, as is uh, Sylvia. And of course, a lot of our collaborators, only a few of, which, of whom are, are mentioned here. And of course, we've been blessed in the UK with good funding from the British Heart Foundation. And now we have five years funding with the Medical Research Council to allow us to continue with this uh, sort of research work. But we need to encourage many others to get involved uh, in, in the lymph system uh, if we're going to make really good progress in finding new treatments. Uh, this is just an example of the cover of the book that uh, I'm not, I've got <laughs> no uh, financial interest in the book at all. I just want to get it out there, really. Um, and the chapters 
that tell us about the lymph system, the perils of infection, treatments, what it's like to live with lymphedema, um, and particularly elements like uh, children with lymphedema, other forms of lymphedema, particularly uh, facial lymphedema and different body sites. And then finally, lymphedema worldwide, because it is a global disease, as we were saying earlier. So this is my final slide. This is a, a, a young lad uh, who appears in the book. His name is Rafa, and he's, be, he's been very happy to uh, be named and known as Rafa. And he's called Rafa because his mother liked Rafael Nadal, tennis player. So it was a great fun to be able to take him to Wimbledon to play uh, tennis. And uh, you can see that he's got pink gloves on and he's got pink gloves on because he's got lymphedema of both hands. And despite that, he's still able to hold a tennis racket and beat me. So, and that's uh, when he's seven. So goodness knows what's going to be like in years to come. But it, it's a great story. And uh, you can read Rafa's story in the book. So thank you very much. We have some questions. Okay, Coming Bill. In. Uh, first question. Uh, when do you think there will be a drug treatment for primary lymphedema? Well, that's a very good question. I think the answer is uh, <laughs> very soon. I'm very optimistic. The reason I say that is, first of all, um, Many of you will be aware that uh, Professor Stan Roxon from Stanford has already started drug trials in secondary lymphedema and is hoping to extend a particular type of drug uh, for use in primary lymphedema. But I'm also hopeful that the research that's being undertaken, not so much by us in humans, but in biology, trying to understand what the mechanisms are for these disease, these scientists and biologists will hopefully be able to target uh, the fault, the genetic fault in the tissues of the lymph system and in time then design targeted treatments uh, for particular conditions. So uh, like the Milroy disease I mentioned, uh, where I think the fault is purely a failure of the little lymph vessels to work properly, I, I do feel strongly that that can be uh, a potential uh, target for, for drug treatment in, I won't say the near future, but certainly in the future. Uh, another question that relates to uh, secondary, uh, asking, will gene testing ever be helpful for secondary lipidema? Well, I think eventually it might be. Uh, I referred to earlier and said that uh, uh, I feel many forms of secondary lymphedema do have a genetic susceptibility. And uh, if we take just breast cancer related lymphedema, for example, uh, I think it's looking highly likely that some women, uh, I say women, 1% of breast cancer affects males, so they get it as well. But in general, it's women. Uh, that there does appear to be uh, some evidence coming through that there is a genetic predisposition to that. You, it's not that unusual to hear mother and daughter might have not only the breast cancer but get the lymphedema as well. Um, but I think it's not going to be one single gene like I was talking about with some of the primary lymphedemas. I think there may be a range of genes that might provide a genetic susceptibility. So if we then have a gene panel, we might be able to stratify risk according to uh, whether someone's likely to get lymphedema. And or that may be important at the stage where lymph glands are removed or not removed. Or, or chemotherapy is given or not given according to risk. So I think, I think genetic uh, testing may well become part of management of even some of the secondary lymphedemas in the future. Uh, you actually have a, a, a gene pool study uh, that you're doing currently. Well, yes, we've, through our identifying uh, a number of uh, genes, 
Uh, I think we found about eight genes here and others around the world have found other genes. Those genes that are now known, we've put together in a gene panel that is available. Uh, uh, and so all one needs is a blood test so that DNA is available so that we can subject that DNA to the gene panel and see if it comes up with any particular known gene to cause primary lymphedema. If it's a mosaic fault, such as I was talking about with the birthmarks, then in the future it will need a biopsy of the birthmark tissue to und undertake uh, gene uh, testing. But the gene panel is now up and running at St George's, and this will be available throughout the UK for anyone who wants to provide a blood sample for DNA testing. Now tell me, is that available beyond the UK? Let's say someone in India, the United States, is yes. interested. Yes, it How is. How would they go about? Well, uh, it's, I'm no geneticist, but as far as I understand, we would just need uh, the, uh, DNA. Uh, so I don't know how easy it is to send blood samples, but certainly DNA can be sent. And the price of it at the moment, I think, is about £650, which seems a lot. But bearing in mind before that, each individual gene testing might have been £300, £400, £450. So to have a range of genes testing is actually quite good value. But it's still worthwhile being relatively confident that your phenotype fits in to the area covered by that gene panel. Otherwise, you're sort of rather wasting your money. So you do want to be confident that your patient's characteristics sort of fit one of those genes that exists in the, in the gene panel. So if, in fact, people are so advised in other countries, they can contact uh, St. George's? Yes, absolutely. Yes, they can contact us or the contact learn and then you can uh, send the details on to us. It's probably the easiest way at the moment of uh, answering that question. Uh, yes, and then we can uh, if undertake that testing if, if appropriate. Excellent. Uh, another question. Uh, why are the new microsurgery operations not more widely available for primary lymphedema? Well, the trouble with primary lymphedema is that, as I was alluding to, there are often different mechanisms causing the lymphedema, mineral and lymphedema distocasis cases in point. So, for example, the, uh, there are a number of operations. The main one probably is the lymphatic venular anastomoses. This is an operation, a super microsurgery operation, where a tiny little lymph vessel is connected to a vein to overcome a downstream blockage so the lymph can then drain freely away through this join between a small lymph vessel and a vein. But that operation would only work if a lymph vessel that was blocked could be identified. So in Milroy disease, it's a non-starter. So it very much depends on what the fault is uh, as to whether that surgical operation is suitable. So, uh, for example, the other operation that's uh, being used is lymph node transfer on the principle that one might be able to put a lymph node in and grow lymphatics to undo a block. That's still, I think, more unclear as to how successful that is. But again, the answer is the same. It depends on the mechanism that's causing the lymphedema as to whether that particular operation is suitable or not. So it all depends on the mechanism. Uh, a question here that relates to lipedema. And the question is, does lipedema cause lymphedema? If so, will weight loss help either or both? Okay, well, it's good that we've mentioned lipedema because uh, we also have a research program uh, funded by the Lipedema Foundation in the States, uh, looking at the genetic basis of lipedema. I think it's important to explain that lipedema is uh, basically a swollen or swollen legs due uh, uh, fat deposition independent of obesity. It's, it gives rise to 
uh, disproportionate fat swelling, uh, fat uh, on the legs. And therefore the name comes from lip meaning fat and edema meaning swelling. Whereas lymphedema means lymph fluid largely collecting in the tissue to give rise to, to swelling. But lipedema does give rise to lymphedema over time. We don't understand why. My hypothesis is that lipedema is not just about fat. There is probably a degree of lymphatic dysfunction responsible or present in lipedema, hence why many of the women who get it, because it seems to be uh, mm. a female disorder, why they then can go on to develop lymphedema. So uh, there's a lot of research work to do with lipedema before we understand uh, what's going on and what might be the best treatment for it in the future. But yes, is the, my, my short answer, yes, lipedema can cause lymphedema. I think uh, perhaps we can close. There's one uh, more of a comment than a question that came in saying, so excited to read the book. Thank you for putting it together and for the work you and your team do for our community. Well, thank you very much. I think, uh, Professor Mortimer, which you prefer, professor or doctor? In the United States, we use doctor, but here in the UK, they seem to use professor. Uh, I since don't you mind. Do teach at the uh, university I, as I well. I don't mind. I respond to anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll just call you friend at this Absolutely. point. Thank you very much for doing this. Yeah. Uh, for our audience uh, out there, having somebody of the stature of Dr. Mortimer to come forward and uh, to provide uh, this information is uh, to use what they would say here, brilliant. Well, that's very kind. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter.